so before we start, I would like to first introduce Indian Institute of Business Psychology, what we are and what we do. So Indian Institute of Business Psychology is a member-driven non-profit organization and is an accrediting body for psychometric testing, coaching and training methodologies. We address the long-term need of businesses to raise standards of certified trainers, coaches and agencies who provide psychological services to organizations. We also provide courses to students and employees, and we have an upcoming course on transactional analysis in the month of March. And under our mental health initiative, we have a panel of prominent counselors who provide counseling at a subsidized rate. So the main objective of IIB is to apply knowledge and practices from psychology to make organizations more humane and socially ethical and responsible. That's why keeping that aim in mind, we have started this webinar series with the motive to take business psychology forward through, the, through conversations. And our topic for today is organizations through the lens of Freud. And our speaker to, for today is Dr. Jimmy Modi. Uh, so let me first introduce Dr. Jimmy Modi. He has worked for more than 20 years as a psychotherapist, researcher, consultant, coach, author, and a speaker. He has extensive experience in dealing with issues related to fears, anxiety, depression, relationships, obsessions, group and organizational behavioral interventions, leadership, developmental processes, and societal ideations. His mission is to help people overcome their mental obstacles in order to achieve their full potential of living and working. He's the author of several papers that have been published by international peer-reviewed journals on, this, on the subjects called Celebrating Differences, Wisdom Through Relationships and is available both on Amazon, Flipkart, and Kindle. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here with us, sir. And with any further ado, we would like you to start with the webinar. Thank you, Vaibhavi. Greetings to all of you. We've got a big, big subject to try and cover in a short, short time. So I promise I can only do my best. I think we all need to start with an understanding brief history of Freud and where he really came up from. Freud was born in 1856 in Moravia in Austria and qualified to become a neurophysiologist, a neurologist, a doctor of medicine. He had no training at all in psychology or psychotherapy whatsoever. At about that time that he was working, World War I was in progress and there were a lot of fallout of war victims who were suffering from war trauma and other such things. He tried to cure them, he tried to help them with the only ways that he knew best. There's no form of real psychotherapy being practiced at that time. And certainly psychoanalysis did not exist. So what did he start with? He started with things that we might sound, might sound a little crazy to us. He started with hot and cold water shock baths for trauma victims. That didn't really work too well. So he collaborated with a French doctor and started with hypnotherapy, hypnosis for war, war victims. He tried that for a while, but that too didn't work very well. Another problem that he was facing at that time was, was that uh, the women in society in those days were very, very submiss sub uh, restricted, sub uh, suppressed by society. They had to wear corsets, long dresses, gloves. Their sexuality particularly was very suppressed as compared to the women of today. And so what became the problem in those days was a problem called hysteria which Freud defined as being the investment of the woman's womb in that part of the body that was symptomatic. So a woman got paralysis of her arm 
it was seen that the womb of that woman was invested in that in that arm, or there was a tremor or if the twitching, it was seen as a womb in that part of the body. Here again, he tried hypnosis, hypnotherapy. Nothing seemed to work to his satisfaction. It was through the process of trial and failure that he discovered a completely new process, which he called psychoanalysis. He was the founder, pioneer of psychoanalysis. And he built up the entire practice of psychoanalysis based on his experimentation with people, based on his observation of his patients. He had no previous theory to go on. So how did he do this? This makes for an interesting story. And what was psychoanalysis? What was so great about psychoanalysis that made it work, whereas all the previous therapies did not seem to work? So Freud discovered that through a simple process of what he called free association, he could get some results. What was free association? Simply that every therapy session was completely unstructured. Did not start with any assumptions, any theories. The analyst sat with the client or the patient and simply allowed the patient to speak whilst the analyst listened attentively. And the analyst also tried to observe the patient observe the patient and everything that was going on in that room. And everything that was going on in that room, Freud called the psychoanalytical setting, which include the patient, the analyst, and anything else that was in that room. So Freud used all of this to develop a theory of psychoanalysis and a practice of psychoanalysis. Most of his work, yes, was with individuals, but he did begin to start working and thinking about groups. Some of his books that he wrote, like Totem and Taboo, and some other books and some other papers, showed that he gave a lot of thought, reflection, and effort into understanding individuals in a group setting. So, Psychoanalysis then turned out to be something quite different from what most psychologists, psychotherapists prefer to work with today. It was a system of completely free association. I know I have been invited down to give a talk to the professors, teachers of Bombay University, uh, MA in MA or PhD, I can't remember, in psychology a long time ago. And they were quite unprepared for what to expect. Because like we all expect in such seminars and workshops and talks, that it would be a structured thing. First I'd start with this, then I'd start with that. There'd be some structure to it. We like structure, don't we? We all depend on structure. We'll feel comfortable with structure. But what happens if there's no structure? What happens if you enter a room and there's no structure? There's only a title of what we're going to discuss. And then if everyone sits there tongue-tied, well then so be it, we all sit there tongue-tied. And then can we sit there tongue-tied and listen and observe the silence? What does the silence make everyone feel? What does the silence make you feel? What does the silence make the analyst feel? Can we observe that? So this then became oh, the tools of psychoanalysis. Why did Freud embark on this kind of method? Because Freud realized and was amongst the first to realize that the human mind comprised of not just the conscious mind, but it also comprised of something called the unconscious or the subconscious mind. And that there was a lot more going on in the subconscious and unconscious mind 
than there was in the conscious mind. In my later studies, when I was also training in hypnotherapy, the Hypnotherapy Motivation Institute in California had come up with a structure of the mind where it showed the mind as comprising of approximately between eight to 12% of that mind was only conscious. The remaining 90 plus percent of the mind was unconscious. So if that is true, just imagine 90% of everyone who is here present, 90% of each of our minds is unconscious. We have no idea what it's all about. We have no idea what it's doing. When we enter an organization, a group, a large group, a small group, a corporation full of people, maybe a hundred people, we have a hundred minds and 90% of those hundred minds don't know what is going on in those minds. And so then we complain to our bosses that our subordinates don't listen to us. We go to work and we try and face the nine o'clock blues and the anxieties of going to work. And what do we do about that? We meet those anxieties with resistance. And there starts all the internal politics of organizations that all of us know about and dislike intensely. How do we tap that vast resource of the unconscious mind of the organization? That would be an amazing feat and an amazing achievement if we could do it. Think about it. So Freud discovered but the best way to understand, to know, to penetrate and see the unconscious mind was through the process of first allowing free association. And in the atmosphere of free association within a certain given repetitive setting to learn how to observe. And the accent was on learning how to observe the mind. Now, when I went down to the uh, Bombay University campus to give that talk to the MPhil, ah, it was MPhil's uh, teachers, they expected not only a structured talk, they expected that I would talk about psychological testing and diagnosis. That's what I heard Vaibhavi talk about just now. That, that's what IIBP does as well as other things. Psychological testing is so important, isn't it? It's the beginning of any training in psychology, in any education, academic or otherwise, in psychology, isn't it? But not in psychoanalysis. I had to try and explain to that audience that I don't do any testing at all. Worse still, I don't believe in testing. Instead of testing, I have over the years grown to rely on the powers of observation that I've learned to develop within me, which I find far more reliable than the psychological testing methods of academic psychologists. So let's look at this because this ability to observe was something that I found was one of the greatest takeaways I got in my psychoanalytical training, which by the way, lasted for about five years in Bombay. It was one of the greatest takeaways. Whether I attended any other workshop, any other form of psychotherapy, worked in any setting, I found myself ahead of the class, simply because I could see what's happening, whereas others, including the teachers, could not. 
So I want to emphasize to you the importance of developing your hours of observation. So the first thing we must realize is we are not just looking at what the conscious mind talks about or says and what our conscious mind sees and hears. We're also looking at what the unconscious mind is going on in the unconscious mind, both in the other and in myself. And the first and most important rule which my psychological trainer taught me, and I'm forever grateful to him for this, is to learn how to observe and not assume. Can you even observe how many times you assume things? How many times you go on the basis of assumptions about other people, about events, about things, and even about yourself? Assumptions, assumptions, assumptions. Some of these assumptions are just so, so subtle that you cannot even see them half the time. I'm getting some background noise. Shekhar, I think you need to be on mute. So assumptions, you need to be aware of how much of your life is based on assumptions, how much of your relationships and the way you relate is based on assumptions. How can you possibly observe anything if you go on the basis of assumptions? You cannot observe anything if you're assuming because from the assumptions you make conclusions, you make labels, and you don't make the effort to make observations. If you look at this issue of power of observations, it rhymes very closely to the power of now, which Eckhart Tolle and others have talked about. In the present moment, what is happening in front of you and within you? Can you see that? Because if you're making assumptions, you're going on the basis of how you have typed, typified the other person, people, things, and events. Don't do that. Start a rigorous exercise every minute of every day of learning to observe what's going on in you, learning to observe what's going on outside of you, people near you, people you know, even people you don't know. Can you observe their emotions? And a whole new wonderful world will open to you. I promise you that. So all of Freud's theories, ideas developed purely from his observations. There's very little help from others. The only other authors and writers that he really gleaned from was people like Shakespeare, Goethe, Nietzsche, and others. And he's quoted from them in his books. So his is a real example worth looking at. So he started a trend, which then a lot of his students, a lot of his students, took under their wing, did their research, and came up with their own contributions. Students and subordinates like Abraham, Melanie Klein, his own daughter, Anna Freud, Don Meltzer, Wilfred Bion, 
but most of his work was just to do with individuals. But he then started doing some work with groups, on groups. Okay. And he started then reading and, and comparing his work in groups with Gustave Le Bon, who was from born in 1841 to 1931, about the same time as Freud. To briefly touch on some of the important things that came out of Freud's work, were authors and psychoanalysts like Melanie Klein, Fairburn, who developed a whole theory on splitting, fragmentation, and integration, which gave us a tremendous deep insight into the human psyche and how it works. Klein, especially Melanie Klein, developed the theory of splitting. She took the instance of a newborn child who's just been brought to his her mother. And as we all know, the first child, when it's first brought to his her mother, brought to one of the mother's breasts. It's the very first thing that the child sees and experiences of the external world is that breast, is the nipple of that breast of that mother. The child then relates only to the nipple of that breast of that mother. And if the mother gets tired of feeding the child on that nipple and wants to move it to the other breast, then the second thing that the child develops a relationship in his entire life is the second breast. And maybe the second breast is not as fulfilling as the first breast. So somewhere the child begins to develop its very first ideas of good and bad. Good breast versus bad breast. Good nipple versus bad nipple. As the child goes older, the child begins to see that, hey, the mother is not just the breast. There's a lot more to the mother. The mother's torso, the mother's abdominal parts. The whole body of the mother slowly comes into view of the child and realization of the child and consciousness of the child. And soon the child begins to feel not just nourishment from the mother, but also love. And the child begins to use that love to contain its anxieties of good and bad. And thereby use that to start integrating all the different parts of the mother into one whole mother. And the whole mother then emerges. Think of it as very much what we all do. Something is either good or bad. Someone is either good or bad. Do we ever think of integrating the good and bad in people into one? No. Sometimes we do. But we need to do so more consciously. And Krishnamurti, the famous sage, referred to this when he talked extensively about the phenomenon of fragmentation. The world we live in is a fragmented world. He said, large cause, largely the cause of that is our own selves, our own minds, our own egos. We are fragmented within us and therefore the world becomes fragmented. Look at the world today. Is it not fragmented? Full of divisions, of caste, religion, race, countries. Where is the integration? Look within the organizations 
lots of divisions, lots of competitors, rivalry. Is there anyone there to integrate? Well, we all hope and look upon the leader of the organization or the leader of the group to provide the, the task of integration. So we have also in Pride's efforts to understand and study groups. He finally published a book or a paper which he called Group Psychology and the Analysis of the Ego. This was published in 1921. Other books referred to this civilization and its discontent as one totem and taboo is another. And so Freud used psychoanalysis to make his contributions into understanding groups, large and small commercial and non-commercial. And he came upon something that he called and discovered and observed as being the group mind, the group identity, and from which there were group norms, which the group consciously as well as unconsciously followed. A group identity which was conscious in groups as well as one that was unconscious in groups. You might belong to a group like we are right now in a group. And we may have a flag, we may have a banner, we may have a uniform and other aspects, more manifest aspects, more conscious aspects of identity. But the large part of our identity is unconscious. How can we really put this group to use if we don't know, understand the unconscious aspects of the group? That becomes critical then, doesn't it? And Freud is one who helped us to do that. He laid the foundation stones for it. For, in order for observation and as, uh, to become a success, in order to develop the skills of observation, it became imperative, I saw, in our psychological training group to learn not to be judgmental. We are all too happy to be judgmental. All of life is based on judgmentalism. You might ask, how can you live, do anything without judging anything or anyone or any situation? And I struggled that, with that act, aspect, that prospect for the last, I would say, 20 years. And if you observe, you are looking at something that's happening in the here and now, in the present moment only. And what you see in the present moment is what you can observe. But don't label it, don't judge it, as tempting as that might be. Instead, just describe it. If you have a patient sitting in front of you and you observe something happening, just describe it as the best feedback you can give him or her. Don't tell him, oh, you are always doing this, or you seem to be like that. Just describe in the present moment, this is what I see you doing, full stop. Can we do that? Try it and see how powerful it is in an individual setting and see how extremely powerful it is in a group setting, in an organization. Just simply observe and describe and state what you have described and then see what the group does with that description that you've just given them. 
It's amazing what can come out of it. So, to quote from The Psychoanalysis of Organizations, which is a book by Robert D. Bord, I'd like to quote from it by saying, one of the most pressing needs for modern society is to understand and construct organizations that are not only effective in terms of carrying out work, but that also allow and encourage people to develop their full human potential. That also allow and encourage people to develop their full human potential. Imagine being able to do that. And so psychoanalysis is a resource for anyone trying to make sense of the irrational side of organizational life. That was what the subconscious, the unconscious mind was seen as being. It was seen, it is seen as being the irrational side of organizational life. So we need to think on all of these questions carefully. Why describe psychological mechanisms at work within us as mass movements? A mass, according to Freud, is a temporary entity consisting of heterogeneous elements that have joined together for a moment. He refers heavily to the writings of sociologist Gustave Le Bon. Like Le Bon, Freud says that as part of the mass, the individual acquires a sense of infinite power, allowing him to act on impulses that he would otherwise have to curb as an isolated individual. So being a member of a group makes the individual feel he has a source of infinite power or of great power. She would otherwise resist strain, resist feeling, resist acknowledging. Many of us might see that power in, in various organizations as a form of arrogance. Observe it. Can you try and observe arrogance without naming it as arrogance? What will happen if you learn to do that? These feelings of power and security allow the individual not only to act as part of the mass, but also to feel safety in numbers. So every individual in the group develops the identity of the group within the individual mind, and the identity of the group develops in the group mind. And the group has an identity and an entity of its own standing. This safety number in numbers is accompanied, however, by a loss of conscious personality and a tendency of the individual to be infected by any emotion within the mass. Overall, the mass is impulsive, changeable, and irritable. It is controlled almost exclusively by the unconscious. The Bon explains that the state of the individual in the crowd is hypnotic. Freud agrees with Le Bon on this. State of mind of the individual in the group, in the crowd, is hypnotic. This is interesting, particularly since most of Latter-day psychoanalysts get an allergic reaction if you talk about using hypnosis instead of psychoanalysis. It's almost like a religious taboo. Because then the purity of psychoanalysis and psychoanalytical practice 
has been violated in what they think. Freud refers back to his theory of instincts and believes that masses or groups are held together by libidinal bonds. All groups are held together, bonded together by libidinal bonds. Each individual in the group acts on impulses of love that are diverted from their original objectives. They pursue no sexual goal, but do not therefore work less vigorously. The group is held together by a notion of love. Are we conscious of that? Do we go around telling everybody in the group that we love each other? No. That's not a done thing. It's a very much resisted thing, isn't it? In addition, admiration and idealization of the leader of the group takes place through the process of idealization. The narcissistic libido is displaced to the object which is loved because of its perfection, which the individual has sought for his own ego. I'm seeking constantly for perfection, aren't we all? Yes. And I'm constantly having to face the fact that no, I'm not perfect. So what do I do? I find one guy who I see as the leader, my boss. I really, really need him to be perfect. So idealize. But there's a great problem when we idealize people, whether in a political context, social context, or an organization or corporate context. The ideal person then becomes like a murti on a pit street, which when it falls, smashes and breaks into smithereens. That causes a lot of pain, disappointment, distrust. So it's best to become aware of this idealization. Is it taking place in groups? Are you beginning to feel it as a facilitator of the group? So Freud therefore also had come up with the three states of mental life of a person. The id, which is the instinctual desires of every person is the set of uncoordinated, unchartered desires that we all have. The superego plays a critical moralizing agent in all of us, judging, wanting to judge, wanting to be critical of each other, and especially wanting to be critical of ourselves. Can we observe that in action? The ego is the organized, realistic agent that tries to mediate between the id and the superego. The ego is also seen as a self-preservator instinct. So in the various group that I have facilitated, including very large groups of more than 100 people, to small groups of 10, 15 people. I've often had to face situations when nobody had anything to say. And the pressure on me to do something about that became tremendous. Why did I have to be the one who fixed that? What was really going on in the group? Was I able to observe what is happening in the group? What are the emotions? 
what is the inner life of members of the group. So if you learn how to do that, you'll have developed tremendous power in your hands, tremendous skill in your hands. It will help you with all kinds of organizational work and interventions that you may ever need to do. I could go on and on and on, on on the subject, but perhaps now would be a good time to have a short break and ask if there's any questions from anybody. Please feel free to come forward with questions. There's a reactions button on the bottom, which you can press to raise your hands if you wish. Yes, Gunit, please come forward, ask. Good evening, sir. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you're very audible. Thank you, dear. Uh, sir, first of all, thank you so much for explaining all this in a very simple manner. Thank you so much. And uh, my question is that, um, uh, according to the theory of instincts, you talked about group bonds and, uh, you know, they are bonded together through love and all. They follow all the norms. So, uh, so you talked about narcissism as well. So can we say that uh, Hitler uh, did all the destruction because uh, everybody followed him bli blindly? Can, can you please give your views on that, sir? First, let me ask you, Gunit. Do you think Hitler was a good leader? Uh, no, he was a narcissist, I think, like, uh, no, not a, like, he was a very disturbed personality, I believe. Yes, he was a disturbed personality, but he had... But, some... but he had a group, sir, and everybody followed him, like, this is something to study, maybe. Maybe you can give your reflections on that. Well, this is what we were talking about, learning to observe, deal with, capture the unconscious minds of groups of people. So Hitler knew how to do that. He chose various historical happenings and, and uh, what would you say, monopolized on it. He, he made something out of it. But yes, he was a very disturbed person. But sir, how could so many people follow him? Like many, many people could follow. Like I said earlier, and like Gustave Lebon also said, there's a certain kind of hypnotic quality going on in the groups, in every group, a certain form of hypnosis, which works either as a contagion or as a suggestion. And people become completely enveloped in it sold to it, mesmerized by it. When the spell breaks, they say, oh shit, what happened? Oh God, how could I have followed that fellow? And that's what also happened when Hitler collapsed. So Hitler had the skills of knowing how to get his people behind him how to hypnotize his people. And so it's not just it. Hitler, sorry, it's not just Hitler who does it, comes to my mind. Because when I was training in hypnotherapy, I remember learning that various great uh, music performers also do that. I'll give you an example. For instance, they, if you ever go to a Brian Adams concert, okay, or any other great personality concert like that, what happens? You're in a big auditorium or in an open space like a Rang Bhavan. Okay, there are thousands of people. You've had to bustle crowds, fight for parking spaces, hassle to get, uh, find your seat. And then you finally sit down and the curtains open. Brian Adams is not there. Some Faltu band is there going fang, 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 fang. And when they finish, then Brian Adams comes with a great, great flourish. By the time the curtains open and Brian Adams comes, everyone is spellbound. 
completely spellbound. Another person who uses this technique, a famous uh, uh, coach come speaker, what's his name? Uh, gosh, I'm getting old, I can't remember names. Uh, an American speaker. Is it uh, uh, Tony Robbins? Yes, thank you. Thank you, that's Tony Robbins. Yes, I was looking for that name. Yeah. He uses the same techniques. So do a lot of people use those techniques. So we can use techniques to hypnotize people. When you go and see a magic show of PC Sarkar, does he actually perform magic? No. What he does is that he chooses very wisely a few people in the audience who he can influence. He first influences them, hypnotizes them, makes them come up on stage and feel that they're bunny rabbits and they can hop up and down. Then once he's got the audience believing in him, he's got the belief systems of the audience in his hands, he then hypnotizes the audience into seeing things that are amazing, incomprehensible. And the audience goes, wow, wow. That's really magic. So hypnosis, yes, does play a large part of it. And as much as psychoanalysts hate hypnotists, I'm one of the few, perhaps the only one psychoanalyst who also became a hypnotherapist. Yes, Dr. Krishnamurti. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was a very nice uh, exposition. I'm hearing about uh, Freud after a very, very long time. I am a doctorate in uh, human resources, actually, in chain management. So yeah. I'm not very much into this uh, psychoanalysis and all that. So, but I have some two questions, you know, which have been uh, there in my mind for a very long time. I think the right time to ask you. Is it okay if I... Yes, please. Go ahead. Yeah, one is that, uh, you know, people talk about the conscious mind, the subconscious mind and the unconscious uh, mind or arena, unconscious domain, we'll say. And uh, some of us say, no, no, it's conscious and subconscious and unconscious together. It's bundled into one. Yeah. So what is the, the main thing there? Because we say, I mean, I have heard and I have seen, uh, I have uh, read that uh, uh, our experiences in life are stored in the unconscious. That means... Uh, any 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 uh, very uh, traumatic events, whether they're sad or some very very high high uh, energy events, very high high degree of happiness coming there, all those are stored in the in the unconscious and they come out with some trigger. So if if it's, if it's do uh, with uh, let's take um, the hospitalization of uh, my father and all that trauma which went through, of course he came back uh, well and safe that time. But then when somebody says, uh, my subordinate says, I want to, I want to go, I want to take a half day off and I want to go for, uh, uh, can, can you, will you allow me? Uh, what's the problem? Problem is my dad's sickness. Now that word can actually trigger in me from that old, this one, a lot of things. I can, I can go into my own space. It's called detouring, we say. Yeah. So it, this comes from unconscious mind or it comes from the subconscious mind. This is my humble question. Yeah. <coughs> yeah Dr. Krishnamurti is like this. The, as I see it, and I like to keep things simple. I, I've, I've read all about the conscious, the subconscious, the pre-conscious, the unconscious, the this conscious, the that conscious. For me, I like to keep it just simple based on the understanding of the language of the words. Conscious, which means cognitive, you can see, you know what you know, and unconscious, which is what you don't know. Make it okay. simple, just these two things. Okay. But I'm in the habit of using the word subconscious sometimes to refer to the unconscious. And the word subconscious really means anything and everything that lies below consciousness. Uh -huh. I had a, the only slide I have really to show, which I did not show because I'm not good at this computer stuff, is the famous picture of an iceberg where the tip of the iceberg only is lying above water and the rest of the iceberg is submerged below the water. Right, right. 
most of the iceberg you'll find is actually below the water and very little above the water. Okay? And that's what the human mind resembles in many ways. Okay? Uh, increasingly nowadays, we find the need to be able to work with the unconscious or the subconscious mind. And we're trying to find many ways of doing this. Hypnotherapy is one, psychoanalysis is the old one, meditation is another one, chanting mantras might be one. Oh. And also, uh, a lot of religious texts and teachings talk about God as an entity that's not up there or over there, but as something that is within us all. So where is God? Can I see him? No, I can't. Where is he? Actually, God is in your unconscious mind. Obviously, because you're not conscious of him, he must be in your con unconscious mind if he is in you at all. So what is your potential as a human being? Maybe you could be so bold as to say, my potential as a human being is a God potential is a potential to be God. Wow, can you imagine an organization full of God potential beings, what we could accomplish? Wow, man, amazing. How do we get there? Right. Right. Thank you, I think, uh... I'll ask this is the positive of time. There's one more question is there. Yes. Uh, that, uh, you know, observation without judgment. And you have dwelt on, uh, uh, you have dwelt on that, that, you know, we have a lot of assumptions in life and uh, uh, stating whatever we observe without any judgment is what is the key. Oh, is that key? Yes. How, how, how does it happen? I don't know why it's happening. Someone's. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Are you hearing me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you well. So okay. I'm saying, that, uh, I'm saying that how can it lead to therapy or how can it lead to improvement in that person just by observation and stating what is. See, Dr. Krishnamurti is like this. Uh, the most powerful and most convincing intervention that you can make at any time in a psychotherapy or psychoanalytic session with a client or a patient is to point out to him exactly what he is doing in the here and now, right now. He cannot argue it, he's bound to see it. And it's going to strike him, oh my God, yes. Right. Okay, okay. You know, in my training in psychoanalysis, one of the trainers, one of the junior trainers in one of the groups which we had to meet we had to meet this group had to meet on Thursdays. I made a, some kind of comment using an example from my work. And the trainer facilitator pointed at me and said, Jimmy, why didn't you ask the question directly? Uh -huh. So I said, because I was trying to observe, but don't you have any curiosity? Don't you want to know? Aren't you curious to know? Uh. I said, yes. So it says, no, you have no curiosity. So that one felon sweep, he branded me with an assumption and a generalization that I have no curiosity. <laughs> what did that do to me? I went into my shell. It put you down, yeah. It put me down. I did not show any more of myself over there. Absolutely. So what good is a therapy session that goes like that? Instead, yeah. you could simply say that, you know, as I'm listening to you, Jimmy, this question appears in my mind. And I'm wondering whether it also appeared in your mind at the time. Excellent. Right? Yep. So let us work, my friends, 
on this becoming aware of assumptions and becoming most aware of the distinction between a, a observation and an assumption. Do you know what is the difference between an observation and an assumption in your life? Go through each of your beliefs and challenge them. Is this an observation or is this an assumption? Okay, I have one more question. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Modi. Thank you. Yes, Manish, please come forward. Okay. Very good evening. I can't see you, Manish. Hello. Hello? Yeah, yeah. One, one second. Yeah, can you hear? Can yeah, I can see you and hear you. Thank yeah. you, Manish. Yeah. So I have a one question. Actually, uh, I just wanted to know, can you share any inputs to translate our observation and communication to effective communicate with people? Especially uh, when there is a conflict or intersect of or disagreement. Okay. Like, like, yeah. Uh, well, one thing that comes to my mind is something that, that Freud discovered, which I have not talked about yet, which maybe I should very quickly talk about. And he discovered something through his observation of it with a client of his, which he called transference and counter transference. So, transference in your sitting with a patient or a client is what the patient is unconsciously putting into you and hoping that you will act out. How you receive that is your counter transference. So to sort of answer, I think, Manish's question. Okay. The most powerful form, the most amazing information that you can get about your unconscious mind is through the constant transference, counter-transference that is going on between you and a patient. And also between the transference, counter-transference that's going on within a group setting. Learning to observe that however, has got some pitfalls. In one particular case, which I remember distinctly, there was a young girl, okay? She was disabled with multiple sclerosis. She would come to me in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. She was very young, never had a boyfriend, never explored her sexuality. Mm -hmm. And in the many meetings that we had, I began to feel in some strange way, without being able to point out to anything that she said, I began to feel, is she, is she trying to seduce me or what? Because I'm feeling very seduced and horny by her. And I can't find anything that she specifically said to make me feel that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I remember having studied and trained in my psychoanalysis on transference, counter transference. And I realized that the poor little girl was really missing any sexual experience and exploration in her life with a man. And she was trying to relive it through me unconsciously. So my first thought was, wow, she's a pretty girl and she fancies me. She's trying to seduce me. What does that make me feel? Mm -hmm. so I said, wow, that makes me feel very flattered. I feel like flirting with her. Maybe we can give this whole psychoanalytical thing a kick in the ass and just the two of us get together and have a great time. Mm -hmm. And if I had gone down that route, I would have learned nothing about her subconscious mind or about mine. Absolutely. But I didn't go down that route. I stayed on course and was able to observe my own counter-transference and my own need to be sexually appreciated by an attractive young girl. So there was a conflict there for a while. 
which I had to fight with within myself. That is part of the power of observation. Right. When I talk about observation, that is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about not jumping to conclusions, not getting hooked by any triggers of what is said. But nowadays, uh, the, the the younger generation don't have the patience to like observe things. So how can we uh, be patient and observe things like as it is? Manish, yeah. I understand what you're saying, my dear Manish. Yeah. I was young when I started my training in psychoanalysis. I too did not have patience. Okay. And I was full of passion of this and passion of that, which is why I did not have patience. But patience is not something that drops from heaven in something that you learn to develop. It's hard, hard work within yourself. Right. So as a young generation, very few of the young generation are really on the course of training themselves for patience. But imagine if they were to do that. Right. What they could become, what their potential could develop into. Yes, sir. I mean, imagine your potential. You have within you, my dear Manish, a God yes. potential, potential to be infinite. Yes. We all like to think we are already infinite. So we're quick to jump to assumptions and judgments. But really the only person who's qualified or competent to judge is one who's infinite. Hmm. Isn't that so? Right. right. But we have a lot of distraction, like this, yes. uh, uh, the, the Android mobiles and everything, like we are totally distracted. So how can I, how can we like uh, fully focus? We don't know. Yeah, like, I understand what you're saying, Manish. Uh, not just the younger generation. The people at all ages are facing this problem. And today, more and more, the Indian Eastern version of spirituality is seeking to address this problem with the forms of meditation. And the form of meditation that originated in India and has spread widely in the US and other countries is a form of meditation called mindfulness. And mindfulness meditation is only part of an overall practice called mindfulness practice. And in one of my corporate track, with a few of my corporate clients, I've introduced the practice of mindfulness practice and mindfulness meditation on a regular basis. Another thing that you can also become aware of and observe when you're in a setting like this, or when you're in an auditorium listening to a music, musical recital, or whether you're in a conference listening to a speaker or a workshop, or listening to the department head talking to you, can you see and be fully aware of how your attention moves? Yes. Why does it move? What makes it move? How easily does it move? Can you focus your attention on the here and now, what's happening in the present moment? Yes. That's what mindfulness is all about. That's what psychoanalysis is all about. I began to see and realize psychoanalysis almost as a form of meditation. Right. Yes. yes. Okay, Manish. Thank you so much, sir. Thank um, you, Manish, for your question. Looking forward to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, thank you all. It's 6.15 now. I hand over the dais to Bhai Bhavi. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for making such a vast subject so simple to understand for us. 
And I think the best takeaway from today, personally for me, would be the thing you said about observation is don't judge, don't label, just observe, just describe. And I think that is something that we really forget and we'll just cluster behaviors and actions and just assume them under some label, which may trigger the person in front of us and even may not hold true for them. So I think this is a very, very insightful thing that I have learned. And uh, I would really like to thank you for your time and delivering such an insightful session. Also, uh, now we can end the session and we will be sending you a recording of this webinar. So if there is something that you would like to go through again or is this something or, you know, you have missed some part of it, you can rewatch it. And we will also be sending a feedback form so you can tell us about your experience of this session and also provide us some suggestions for further sessions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Krishnamurti, is there something? I just want to know whether you can give us the email ID of sir. Email ID. That My email, email ID. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you got paper and pencil? Yeah, ready. Okay. All small letters. Yeah. One word. Taming the fire at gmail.com. T A M I N G T H E F I R E, taming the fire at gmail.com. Okay. Love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, you for everyone. the Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for this opportunity. And I hope you all will benefit and learn to observe. I promise you, and this is a money back guarantee, not that you paid for anything over here. It's a money back guarantee that you will gain tremendously from this training, learning how to observe. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.